ESP.bet. Watch and bet live. Okay, this is episode one of a new League of Legends talk show featuring myself, Thorin, usual host. Have to be the usual host, really. It's the first episode. It doesn't mean chance for anyone else to host. Also, I say that, but has anyone else ever hosted any of my shows? I don't think they have, actually. I don't believe they ever have hosted any of my shows. Probably helps that I produce, record, render, and upload the shows. So if I wasn't available, logically, how could anyone host the show? Right, that's going to be the usual self-indulgent intro. The co-host for this one, permanent co-host, that's right, guys. You know how I irritated you all? By getting like a really intelligent woman who has lots of thoughts about the game and really studies the game. But then you all were like, oh, she's too dry on camera. You know, she's not going to be that good. You know how I did that when I got Kelsey Moser to be the narrative wake host. And you were like, oh, why, why not Loco Doco or Ellis? Like, why, why, why did you pick her? I've only gone and done it again, haven't I, guys? Because I've got another person who fits many of those descriptions, adjectives. It's Emily Rand, also known as Lego Emily on Twitter. And she is a long-time journalist in esports at this point in time. It sounds bizarre to say that, but you're, you've got a few years under your belt now. You've done lots of articles. And crucially for me, <coughs> I always consider the amount of length of time someone's worked by how many pieces they've done. Like, there's a lot of people can be like, oh, I've been in esports for three years. It's like, mate, if you still haven't cracked 20 pieces, you may as well have been in for like a, a month, in my opinion now. So you've done a lot of pieces. Are you ready to do a League of Legends talk show? That's the question, Emily. Yes. Yes, I am. Okay, you're up for the challenge. Good. Yes. This is going to be a show. And like, now, notice, by the way, guys, I didn't say the name of the show there. That's because, by the way, same thing that happened with Narrative Wake. I don't, actually, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I, this might be a shock to people. I'm not a team player. I don't even discuss the, the name of the series with the people who I do the series with. They actually get to find out, like you guys, on episode one, what the series they are now being a part of is called. So you're going to like this one, okay? Because I had to think up a name of a series that's going to be for LCK. Obviously, this show, by the way, I should have said that at the top, really. This is entirely about LCK. That's the whole concept of the show. It's a regular show to run down the games and the teams and see what's happening so that we have, you know, a, a, a spotlight shone on what is objectively <laughs> the best region in League of Legends and, in fact, in the history of League of Legends. So in line with that, Emily, I have named this show League's Next World Champion. <laughs> It's not bad, right? Nice. It's not bad. Nice. Yes. Because realistically, <laughs> any discussion you have about LCK ultimately does boil down to discussing who is going to be League's next world champion. Now, funnily enough, though, sometimes that doesn't always mean it's the LCK champion, as Samsung uh, Oat White in 2014 showed us, and obviously this year Samsung Galaxy showed us, did not win LCK, but did in fact win Worlds. With that said... It's still quite unlikely that anyone except the Korean team is going to win Worlds. And in fact, maybe we can start there with this discussion. Because I did an interview with someone. I forget who it was now. I think oh, I think it might have been like a podcast that was like a small podcast. You know, It wasn't like a big esports publication. And they asked me something along the lines of, like, you know, the classic question. Has the gap closed because of, you know, Misfits coming so close with SK Telecom? And obviously... <coughs> Teams elsewhere, all, you know, obviously WE won a game off Samsung. Samsung lost twice to RNG. So people said the classic question, right, has the gap closed? And I have to say, as depressing as it might sound, I actually said, what's sad about this world, guys, is this, like, yes, for this world, the gap had closed. But actually, this world's going as badly as it did very likely means you will never get a world's like this again. Because, for example, SK Telecom wasn't going to keep that lineup because it had so many problems. Samsung, in that particular kind of setting that they were in, if anything, Samsung's a team that might not even have made it to Worlds. They were the team that got it together at the end of the split. Then you add in, if you'd have made an all-star <laughs> team out of, out of players in LCK, you'd have definitely had a couple of KT players in there. So KT collected all these superstar players and then effectively took them out of the world's pool of talent. So I think actually when you add everything together, and then Longju obviously was such rookies that they'd only played one big playoff series going into Worlds. So I think you're, my initial premise to start with is, surely this year the Korean representatives are going to be stronger. What do you think? Um... I, I definitely hope so. Um, I mean, the big the big question for me last year, if anyone saw, I did, I was part of the giant narrative wake episode where we went over all the teams going into the world championship and I was pulling my hair out over SKT because I'm like, this team is not as good 
as this organization has been previously. They have very obvious flaws and they keep winning. Um, and that they were kind of the huge question mark for me because it's so hard to discount Faker, who, by the way, still played absolutely out of his mind at the World yes. Championship. Yes. Um, and then also just that team's ability to adjust and adapt. And what happened is that they weren't able to do that. Um, and they had two very close matches um, before kind of Faker dragging them into uh, the finals against Samsung. Um, and then obviously the other surprise was that KT were nowhere to be found. And Samsung were a team that had one of the higher uh, winning records just in terms of like match records across regular seasons, but then somehow always managed to like fumble in the playoffs. Yes. Um, and so that's one of the many reasons why people were thinking that KT would not have the insane mental collapse that they did at the end of the season where they basically everything that could go wrong for KT went wrong in terms yes. of them not making the world championship. So, but I think the big, the big thing when you look at the, the, so the quote unquote comparative weakness of the past world championship with Korean teams is def you definitely have to start with SKT um, because that it's, it's kind of the team where everyone everyone is like, but they always win, right? Like they always find a way yes. to win. They always find a way to adjust. They always study uh, what they did wrong and fix it. Um, Which by the way, it's like a classic thing. Whenever you get a record or, you know, a pattern that repeats, I always say this, well, yeah, they always do until the time they don't. And when they don't, it's not going to yeah. matter anymore. You know, <laughs> history won't help you at that point in time. And that's why this season for me is so interesting because, because SKT finally lost, like because... They didn't adjust in time and they didn't win the world championship. And Samsung, who has yet to win an LCK title with this roster, yes. won. Um, now, this field for the upcoming spring split, which starts in about 11 or 10 hours from when we're recording this, um, is it just seems wide open, even if it's even if it's not necessarily the perception because SKT didn't adjust, because they didn't win, because it's not an automatic SKT always wins. It just seems so much more wide open now that uh, that kind of boss has been vanquished. Okay, right. Well, let's start there then. Let's start with SK Telecom because interestingly enough, they did make moves in the off season, but they didn't make any blockbuster moves. Like what's <laughs> crazy is you would have thought this should be the season after all seasons, you know, that they go out there and, you, you know, you make another offer to, to Smear Boy. You go to some other player and you try and pick up some young talent. Whereas instead, all they've done, and this is why I'm going to start with SK Telecom, because I feel like these are some alarming moves they've done. Because the moves they've done <laughs> suggest that their approach to trying to win in 2018 is going to come primarily from coaching, as far as I can tell, because what they've done is they've shed Hooney and Peanut. Obviously, Peanut went over to Longju, who admittedly has changed name now, but it's the same team. Obviously, Hooney has gone back to NA, for that, back for that easy money, but they haven't replaced him. They've kept on Tara, but they've gotten a young player in Tal, who's essentially practically a rookie. If, if, is this his first LCK season? Uh, yes. He was in... Um... He was in the European. So basically, uh, people who know of him know him from a few like really insane Jace games that he had, I believe. Um, and he plays a lot of solo queue, uh, Jace in solo queue. But he came to be part of the uh, Apex uh, <coughs> like challenger team. Then he was on. He was a sub on ZTR, and then he was on Red Bulls last uh, last year, which is where most people know him from. Okay. Before SKT picked him up, so they've brought in him. They've obviously, as we said, Peanut's gone, but they've retained Blank and they've added in Blossom as the substitute jungler. Unsurprisingly, haven't gone with a substitute mid laner because at this point in time, all substitute mid laners clearly do in SK Telecom is like. <laughs> 
I, I, my theory on what they used to use those guys for is because they were never really going to be starters. That was just never going to happen. You First of all, you use them. I, th I always thought, because you always heard rumors that they used scrims where they wouldn't use Faker. I always felt like they purposely used to play the sob midliner just to show the team like what Faker does, basically. Like, this is what happens when you play without Faker, so you can kind of test normal things out, you know. And then this is what happens when Faker comes back. And then secondly, you just sell them off to LPL every year and make quick money that way. So they haven't or gone Brazil. with that approach this I mean, year. Scott I went to Brazil this year. So. Sure. And then they haven't gotten a sub for AD Carry either, but they have gotten a sub for support for Wolf, obviously, who had his own problems last year in a play called Effort. Right. Do you know anything about Blossom and Effort? Um, I don't know that much about either of them. Blossom is a complete mystery to me. Um, and Effort, I saw him play a few times in the Casper Cup, which... So I always say the Kespa Cup isn't necessarily good to look at for results. Like you shouldn't be like, oh man, teams are taking this super seriously and we're going to look at what happened here and then automatically translate it into what's going to happen the next season because like obviously Kongdu ended up in the finals one time and the first in 2000, like the end of 2015 was where that super old CJ team <laughs> made it to finals and yes, he ever won. Um, but he it, what it for what it looks like to me what they're trying to do with effort and it's a similar thing of with what they're trying to do with top lane is that effort they want him to be able to play maybe some of those more aggressive champions that wolf i don't want to i don't even want to say struggles on because it's not that he's bad it's that like if you compare when he picked up the blitzcrank right after ignar played it yes. Um, he doesn't one. take advantage of how aggressive you're supposed to be with that champion, right? Like Ignar is up and he's in your face. And if he has his hook up, he's pushing forward in lane and he's just being a dominating presence. Um, and Wolf and Bang are not that kind of lane. They just, they kind of like to sit back and farm and poke, um, and relax a bit, um, until they scale up and control the wave. And that's not really... They're not what I can, even at their best, they're not a lane that I would consider they're going to be like, oh man, they're going to come out and they're going to crush lane, right? Um, that's not really been their MO. And so what it looks like they're trying to do with effort is they're trying to find maybe a more dominant leading support that has a little bit more presence in lane. Um, I think everyone was shocked when Bang didn't get a substitute um, just because he was the one who was very visibly struggling uh, throughout last year. Like, put it year. this way, okay. To, look, this, is a, this is like a key piece of context I think you have to add to the Worlds tournament for SKT, right? It's very easy to look at the scoreboards and see that Hooney fed lots and lots of kills and think, right, Hooney's an idiot. But you have to understand <laughs> what's bizarre about what SK Telecom did is that everything they did in the top lane was basically a result of the failure of the bot lane because they couldn't change yeah. the bot lane. And therefore they said, well, you can't just have two losing lanes and then have Faker, who everyone knows is going to be there anyway, be the sole carry source. So since bottom lane can't carry, that's why it's not even worthless taking on Tara. Let's just take um, on t uh, Hooney and let's <clears throat> just take blank and peanut and let's just try and play the jungle matchup and then decide when we're going to have to try and force top lane basically and essentially that sounds weird but the point i'm getting at is bang wasn't good anyway at worlds but in a way he was kind of covered for because there was almost someone distracting with their problems in the top lane because they had to go the hooney approach right there wasn't really another way you could have gone on that one yeah and I, I was a huge fan of them bringing hooney actually because it really showed that they were prepping and looking to adjust to their failures in the um championship against Longju um, because a lot of the problems that they that came from that was that Untara really had struggles in the top lane just staying even with his opponent and because um, Longju was a team that had a super reliable bot lane and could focus attention top with BDD holding mid and Cuz kind of like I mean, he is a rookie jungler. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I think the peanut pickup is so good. But um, he, you know, BDD was kind of covering for him by continuously pushing out. So he was not 
threatened aside from one game where blank really exploited the matchup against him and then exploited top lane. Um, but yeah, top lane was a distraction for SKT. Basically, they brought Huni because they're prepping for Longzhu. They wanted someone who w- would be aggressive in lane, who would be able to trade with someone like Khan, um, so that when they s- presumably faced Longzhu again, which didn't happen, but when they were, this is what they were preparing for, um, that they would have someone who could at least stand up to him in lane. And then they would have Blank, again, try to exploit his matchup uh, against Cuz because he is just a lot more savvy in the jungle um, and hopefully have all pushing lanes. Because one thing that SKT's, but like both Peanut and Blank kind of struggled with was that they, when their lanes were getting pushed in, they were not as good at reading the map as when their lanes were pushing forward and winning. Okay. So, Which yeah, is why I, it was kind of baffling, actually, their pick ban in the finals against Longzhu. Sometimes they would pick into losing lanes, and it was just weird. Okay. So then the obvious question then becomes, what do you think the logic is behind this team? Because they've got Antara back, and as you said, here's the thing about Antara. <laughs> he was obviously never going to be a lane-dominant player, but he was okay at times they played him during the split. You know, he had his times where I could see what they were trying to accomplish there. But... You obviously couldn't have him doing that in a world in which then the bot lane was having massive issues in yes. the first like 15 minutes, you know. So with this team they've got now, they lost Peanut, who admittedly definitely had his own flaws, as you say. Like he obviously wasn't very good when he was behind. And then crucially, it looked like towards the end, they just thought, right, well, his job is just camp Hooney's lane. That's it. Like that's your job. You want to gank anyway, camp Hooney. So what do you think they do with this team now? Because it does look on the outset as though, unless they're going to do something special with Tal, they've got, in some ways, a weaker team than last year? Um, I mean, it, so it really depends on the performance of bot lane, I think. Um, if they are, if they come back up to like where they were previously, where they were kind of just, again, farming in lane, they're not crushing lane, but they're not a liability. Um, and Wolf doesn't necessarily have to match support rooms, which is something that I think is kind of underrated when you're looking at SKT last year. When support started roaming, Wolf was not as adept at matching the support rooms and either roaming mid or roaming into the river to control um, to control river vision, even though uh, SKT's like general river vision was really good because they focus on clearing wards a lot in that area. Um, but he would not be able to match more aggressive support rooms. And that was also a huge problem for them, especially with Bang struggling. Um, with Thal, I think what they're trying to do, like, so if you look at the kind of style of player that he tries to be, it's definitely more of a carry player. But it's not even someone, in in my opinion, I haven't seen anything from him that makes me think that he'd even be as strong or draw as much pressure as Huni because even even when Huni's like for example it's not a good thing but when Huni's like dying in top right he's at least drawing pressure up to yes. the top lane so theoretically if your bot lane isn't struggling you can do something but you can have faker push up in the mid lane if you want to you can try to adjust elsewhere on the map to make up for the deficit in top lane I'm not even sure if like Thal is going to be able to draw as much pressure as Huni did. Um, I think that's what they're going for based on what I've seen from his play style. Though. <laughs> okay. So another question I have is, right, the big risk here does, like this is why I'm interested in the effort aspect, if they're going to try and work him in and if they're going to kind of test where they want to go, like maybe just see where the meta goes over the year, you know, because it does seem like, if they are in a world where there's any of those same issues from this bot lane, I could see them having massive problems. Because if you think every other year of SK Telecom, they always had, like, I like here's one of the reasons why I've always thought that bot lane was a bit overrated personally, is because they almost had the option of when to let it carry. Like, they always had a top laner who had, at times in their career had played as the carry top laner, who most of the time in SK Telecom would play like Maokai or a tank of some type. But if needed to, maybe because the pick band's going badly or it's just a bad meta, you can swap up and you can have him play a carry top, you know. The problem they had with Huni was he couldn't really play the tanks as well, so they were stuck in a bizarre scenario where you could always tell by the player who was coming in which direction they were going to go. In a world in which they have to, this bot lane has to do something above average, is this a concern? 
Yes, it is. Um, I, um, I'm, I'm very curious as to why <clears throat> they didn't get an ADC substitute for Bang. Um, just to maybe they felt that because through across the previous years, right, it's been pl about plugging in players on the top side of the map with the Faker Bang Wolf. Yes bot side um and i'm not sure if they just feel like that combination is still something that has worked for them so well like if you if you're just going by results i saw a lot of people being like well why would you get a substitute for bang when they still made a world championship and i kind of disagree with that because i don't think this sk telecom team even in season was as good as um as a lot of the other teams, I think the main thing was that they still were able to adjust enough over their opponents that they made it to the finals. And they obviously also had that bizarre <coughs> stylistic favor over KT, where you can I mean, yeah. put down whatever you want, stylistic or psychological. Mental there was just boom, some, some yeah, reason, we, yeah. Some reason <coughs> they just always beat KT, that definitely helped, right? Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, and so this is, when I look at this team, I'm, I'm not even looking at what they're trying to do top because I actually think if the bot lane performs well, Untara is is fine. I don't think he's bad by any means. Um, I just think he's not the kind of person who's going to draw pressure. And that means you have to create pressure on the map elsewhere. Um, now, Blink is not necessarily someone who's going to come out of the jungle and destroy you. He does have a capability to carry that I think sometimes people underestimate um, because his team fight positioning can be very good um, and I think a lot of people who are comparing him to Bangi in terms of play style is a little bit off because he doesn't have that same kind of sage ability to read the map like Bangi does but he is a better team fighter he, and he can actually carry sometimes the problem is that again you need to have pushing lanes for him um, if you're going to opt blank into that position. And that's not really something that SKT likes to do with their jungler. So even though you might see flashes of that, um, I'm looking at the bot lane and I'm like, can they create pressure against some of these other bottom lanes um, in the LCK? And if we're looking at the top teams, we're looking at Prey and Gorilla, we're looking at Ruler and <laughs> Core JJ and say what you want about them, I think... Ruler stepped up massively right before the World Championship, and then he had a really great World Championship. Um, I think he really, really came into his own in on the international stage, which is very cool to see. Um, and even some of the other bottom lanes, you have a lot of really strong AD carries like Teddy, like Songyun. Um, it's going to be tough for SKT if their bottom lane performs as they did at the World Championship and and throughout uh, some of LCK summer. Okay, right. Before we leave the SK Telecom topic, with all that said, what what would your guess be for <coughs> what this team will actually do? Like, like where would you where do you think they'll end up in terms of the ranking? Because I mean, obviously, sure, we've got some newer lineups or different players, but generally, we have still got KT. KSV, which is the former Samsung team, and Kingzone, Dragon X, which is the former team that was long due. Those rosters are pretty much still intact. So where do you think the new SK Telecom stacks up? Like, are they below all those teams? Are they above any of them? That's where I put them. I put them right below at like a fourth yes. with those three teams above them. Yeah, I was thinking something similar myself, not least because the, the big problem for SK Telecom I see is that right now they're gambling on new, either new players or rehabilitating players that had bad form last year. So that's the big worry for me there. Like it's like I actually was more confident when they had brought in Hooney because at least I know his ceiling's very good. You know, I know he could potentially have done something. So it's a bit worrying for me with these other rosters. I could actually see this being the one where I don't think they even get to the final this time around. So, okay, let's go to another team. The yeah. One thing, one last thing I do want to yeah. bring up with this team is that this is Coma's first year as a head coach. So even yes. though, um, even though the international community kind of attributes all of the SKT coaching to Coma. Their head coach was uh, Carter until this very split. So it's actually Coma now as the head coach and then <laughs> Pumandu and Bengi as the other two coaches on the team and that's their coaching staff. Um, 
And so I'm very curious because this is a challenge that's specific for Coma, and it could be interesting to see just how much coaches matter, right? Because it's so hard to, or for me anyway, in League of Legends, it's really difficult to evaluate the effects of a coach or how much a coach yes. even does for a team. Um, but that is something I'm looking out for with SKT and KT because they both lost their kind of more like managerial overseeing head coach figures that yes. they've had for years. Well, plus, as I, as I kind of said at the outset, when you, when you have so many new players and basically of the players in your team at the moment, the only one who would be considered world-class is Faker. I think if you succeed with this team, even if we can't know how much coaching went in, Odds are quite a lot. If any other team took a call like this and one good player, you wouldn't expect them to have any chance at a top three. So if they can do it, fair play to them. In that sense, I guess Coma will start to redeem himself for the career he's had where, for me at least, you coached <laughs> Faker, you know. That's like the first thing that's on your resume before all the World Championships. Coached, best player ever, by far, could do anything, play everything. Then I start listing your accomplishments as a coach, okay? So I think you're still bitter about Easy Hoon. <laughs> who isn't, right? You know, one day we'll look back and go, oh, what, what was Faker like in that final in LCK Spring? Good, don't know, never played. <laughs> thanks, thanks, mate. So, okay, let's go now. We'll, keep, we'll stick with the Worlds teams for now, and then we'll go into the other ones. So let's actually go with the team that won Worlds. So that's, as I said, KSV Esports, formerly known as Samsung Galaxy, who actually have not changed their <coughs> roster whatsoever. They have not gone for any extra subs. Obviously, they already had Haru, who they even did try playing. They played him against Fenerbahce at Worlds, but they obviously went with Ambition. That ended up being a key component, although I have to say, just sidebar, complete bullshit that he was the MVP of Worlds. In no universe was he the MVP. He wasn't even the best player on Samsung, so I don't know why narratives always win out in this motherfucking game. But then again, that's why I have a team, a name, a show named Narrative Wake, because I must kill these narratives if it's the last thing I do. So, right, here's the question here. Twice in a row, this Samsung team has had these years where they're like a good team. Admittedly, you're right. Last year, they were better than the 2016 run overall. Oh, they yeah. get to Worlds. They do even better at Worlds. Like, they power up for Worlds. You know, they have their own Worlds buff of some wizard kind. But there is that part of you every time that's thinking, why doesn't this ever happen in LCK? Like, where are all these amazing best of five series in the LCK playoffs? Because they never happen. So... Now that they're the world champions and they have kept exactly the same lineup, so they have a chance now to show us, can they repeat? Can they win LCK with this lineup? Can this, do you, do you see this team as the favorite? Um, I put, so when I, again, when I rank these teams, and I think this is a huge issue that a lot of people had with my power rankings, I put Kingzone like just above them um, with the two teams like very close. So if I was doing okay. it in tiers, it'd be those two teams above and then KT slightly below and then SKT slightly below that. Um, so then I why is think, the world champion not the odds on champion to win us? <laughs> I think that this that's what this team has to prove this split. They need to win an LCK split for me because I actually, I do think that winning LCK is more difficult <laughs> than winning a world championship. Um, I do like that they kept their roster. I think... This team is just a team that keeps steadily improving together and they still haven't reached anything that I would look at and be like, oh, this team is uh, this team is done. Like they can't show us anything else. I think they still can, especially with um, like you brought up the fact that they used ambition at Worlds and I don't disagree with that. But I do think the fact that they have kept Haru around, that they were so successful with him in spring um, is really great and shows that. Um, specifically if they have Crown playing really well. Uh, Haru is a great addition to the team because he is more of an aggressive jungler, which adds another dynamic to the entire team, another point of pressure that's really fun to watch um, and changes the way that teams have to prepare for KSV. Um, but yeah, that's the, <clears throat> that's the big thing is can they can they make it through a playoff run? Because it's not even like this team has been bad in the regular season. They've had very obvious weaknesses. Like uh, I'd compare them to SKT where you can see like, for example, Crown played really poorly or um, in spring Ruler had some champion pool issues, which were then completely exploited in the playoffs. Um, this team, it's not like they haven't, had their issues but they've always had a very good regular season record it's about 
bringing that to the best of fives in the playoffs. Um, and one thing I thought that was really good of them at Worlds is that they apparently, uh, and they went on record saying this, a few of their players, they said they really learned a lot from RNG because RNG attacked the bot side so well yes. that they really had to adjust to that. They weren't prepared for it. Um, and they really, really had to adjust to it. And that's how they then went and approached uh, Longzhu. And that they attributed that adjustment to one of the reasons why they went on to beat Longzhu and then went on to win the world championship. Um, so I think this is a this is a team where we've just seen a lot of their players improve steadily, like Ruler, like Core JJ, like QV. Um, again, if you told me back in 2015 that QV would be one of the best top laners, if not the best top laner in the world, I would have been like, are you absolutely insane? Because this guy is not good. Um, but because they've had so much time and room to grow together, I don't think that can be underestimated. So I would say that they they and Kingzone are the are the two favorites for spring. Okay. So I wanted to ask about Crown because while like, I understand why people were so harsh on him last year, <coughs> because in 2016, he was like, for me, like 90% of the reason they ever even made it to the final of Worlds or Worlds itself. Like he was f absolutely phenomenal in that Samsung team. Admittedly, he did used to play fairly limited champion pool. And they did just let him pick Victor all day long, you know. So sure, he maybe like, you know, got to look at his absolute best, you know, and maybe that was a little bit uh, above and beyond. Like actually, when I look back now, some of those Faker comparisons do seem a little bit sort of hasty, you know, like, you know, it's not like Faker only did it for one split and then went to Worlds. He kind of, stacked up quite a lot beforehand but the problem is at the last worlds and for most of last year crown was far from the star player in the team and by the time he got to worlds and obviously was part of their championship run he was incredibly limited in his champion pool in the other way where it looked as though he was just forced to play I mean, what you'd almost describe as like utility mids, you know, where they were almost just saying like, just <clears throat> just do something for us. We're not going to expect you to win lane. We're not going to expect you to be the carry player, but it, it worked somehow. So I, I, what I want to ask is this, right? Was that extremely disappointing for you that he was not a star player, but did he in any way in, in how he played outside of that context show something in being able to sort of at least contribute? Um, I think, so if you look at him on champions, like they basically, they put him on, <laughs> they put him on Galio, uh, they put him on a lot of Malzahar, um, which again, were just champions where he could kind of sit in lane. And even then a couple of times early on in the world championship, you would notice that ambition would just kind of always be around mid um and he basically took on the role of ensuring that crown would safely make it through the laning phase i still think crown is a fairly smart player like if you watch him on champions like talia like lasandra which they also put him on um he is he definitely hasn't lost that outside of lane the problem for Samsung in summer, uh, as opposed to spring, where he was still putting up some really good laning numbers um, and really, really just continuously pushing out mid, was that um, you can't have, like, it's a problem when the map just kind of collapses in from the midpoint because it makes your jung jungler really vulnerable. That's why they went with Ambition instead of Haru. Um, it makes your side lanes a lot more vulnerable. There were games where it seemed like Cuve was kind of single-handedly carrying them um, in summer on champions like Gnar, where he would just be able to turn around a team fight immediately because he still had a pretty strong lane, even when uh, he received no jungle help. So with Crown, <coughs> I think he's still... I think his laning is the is the thing you have to look at like the effect of his poor laning early um and if that continues to happen then it will be an issue <coughs> excuse me um it will be an issue for for ksv that they'll need to continue to put ambition in to kind of cover up for that um but outside of lane i still think he he deserves maybe a little bit more credit than people were giving him because i feel like Maybe um, if people didn't watch Korea as much, 
I kind of expected him to come into this world championship and still be this absolute monster. And then when he wasn't, they were like, oh man, crown sucks now. Um, and I still think he's actually, if you look at some of the moves he makes outside of lane, um, he's still a really smart player. It's just that it's that laning phase. That's really, uh, that was really rough. And that's why you saw them, saw him, uh, on a lot of these like wave clear mids or uh, mids that he could affect the side lanes in with like a Talia wall or a Galio ult or something like that where he would um, show up and, and really try to affect what was going on because his lane was kind of collapsing in. Yes. Now what's interesting, and, and this is where I see the flaw in the Samsung team that I'm still concerned with, because even though they kept all the pieces and there's <laughs> a team that did win Worlds, the big flaw I see in this team is the lack of like a clear superstar player, not just in terms of like be the best at your role, but also have kind of like the carry mentality, like the superstar mentality. Because if you look at this squad, they don't really have anyone who naturally falls into that. Like QV is very good. I would call him like a hybrid top. He can do whatever he wants, you know, but he's generally not going to just get all the carry champions and carry, even if it's in the meta. He'll do it half <coughs> and half. The bottom lane traditionally was more like a lane that was like, you know, we're not expected to carry the game at all, you know. They've gradually leveled up over the years. Mid lane, as we've explained, has its issues. Jungle... Ambition can certainly be one of the better players, but as we've kind of highlighted there, the main reason he's stuck around as such a veteran is because they haven't quite figured out how to make Haru work in the lineup that perhaps has to have Crown. So the big issue here is, in every single region in League of Legends, you pretty much always find that the dominant teams have like a superstar player or a carry player. Because I've always thought this, while yes, if you just had any random team, you would emphasize things like, let's play as a team and let's play the right way and let's make a great read of the meta. In every sport that's a team sport and every region of League of Legends, those qualities can get you to be a very good team. Like you could be consistent, you could make the final maybe, but there's a reason why like the players who win the finals the most are like considered the best players ever. You typically have to have that star player. So do you think that they've got one in this team? Is someone going to emerge this season and come out as like the potential MVP of the whole league? Because I kind of see Samsung as a team that's a good team, like all around, I think they're pretty good, well-rounded, but... I don't know that they've got, like, the potential league MVP in here. Yeah, that's really tough. Um, like, I'd like to say QV, but he is... How do I even begin to describe QV's personality? Because he's just, like, a really affable person who's a super hard worker um, and is just kind of... He is like, oh, I'll, I'll do whatever you guys need me to, right? Like, like that's you, the you problem, need... right? Is that, it, like, especially in the, well, ever since season four onwards, top lane hasn't been exclusively a carry role. It will, it, no matter what happens, you'll always be those metas or those competitions where you have to have a tank anyway. So as a result, sometimes you're going to want the top laner on a tank anyway. So unfortunately, I feel like now you have to be even more crazy of like the carry personality and be like, no, I'm so good. You've got to give me this carry thing. Now, otherwise you're just going to not even play carry champs, like except a third of the time or something, you know? Well, and going into the <clears throat> going into the meta right now, it's still kind of like you're seeing what Orn, Maokai, some Nar. Um, we'll we'll find out tonight what they decide to play, but um, there's still like the obviously like Camille is. Uh, I know she was almost perma banned, I think, or perma banned last night in the LPL. So, um, which is a champion that that Kube has played very well on. Um, but yeah, like I'm, I kind of want to say like, I want to see ruler step up and be that carry, but I'm not sure if he is experienced enough yet. Um, I did well, really... here's the thing. I remember actually at Worlds, this was something I had a little dispute with Papa Smithy about, which he actually said that he thought Ruler was the best late game AD carry at Worlds. And obviously Uzi I was at that tournament and Uzi I was pretty fucking good late game if you get him fed with enough gold and kills. So... What about, I mean, that is kind of a hallmark of Samson. They are pretty good in the late game. If they get to the late game a lot and Ruler's playing very well, this is his chance, right? Yeah, I think, I mean, so Ruler is really weird because he was so, he was so limited in spring, right? And his kind of transformation into this really strong carry for Samsung only happened towards the end of summer and then again in front of everyone at the World sure. Championship. Um, but returning to, so kind of last year, um, was the year where we saw Cuve kind of emerge as like a strong player. And this kind of continuously happens with Samsung where they have, they, they go to an event <clears throat> and you're like, 
this team isn't supposed to be here um, because you know they aren't they aren't as talented on paper as some of the other rosters that are in Korea that stayed behind. But then a one player emerges as like, oh, I didn't know you know Cuve was this good. I didn't know he was this dynamic. Um, and this past World Championship for me personally, that was Ruler. Um, and I know I first noticed it in summer because Core JJ had some struggles before Ardent became like the de facto, like the the default bot lane that you had to play, right? You had to rush Ardent. Um, he was, again, similar to Wolf, but for different reasons because Core JJ is actually really strong laning support. Um, but he was struggling with some of the more like aggressive CC champions um, and roaming. And Ruler was kind of left to his own devices, and I was surprised at how well he did in that uh, in that role um, because I was prepared for him to kind of just die <laughs> repeatedly, and he didn't. He really stepped up, and even though his bot lane partner was struggling, they kind of made it through because he he adjusted and he really grew into his own as a player. Um, so again, going into this split, that's who I would want to see i guess emerge as the carry of samsung if there was if there was anyone from this team just because we keep seeing these players who we might not have thought as much of kind of blossoming into their own on this samsung team um because they play so well as a unit okay <coughs> right let's talk about the third of the world's teams then so this is the team which quite frankly, just underwhelmed because they got they did everything right. They got out of the group that was, in theory, the easy group, and then they made it to the round of eight, and they get drawn against Samsung. Actually, on paper, that's supposed to be, like, cool. Now we're going to the finals, boys. There's only them and probably a, a Chinese team in our way. And instead, they got pretty comprehensively beaten by Samsung, and basically almost every flaw that they had as a team exposed. Like, obviously, even though they were considered the favorite for Worlds, people had noted that Kaz did seem to have some issues as a jungler. People knew now that Khan was clearly a very strong carry jungler, but the question was, what if he's not just on carries? And I think kind of saw that in that series as well. Plus, they did seem to have issues, as they'd actually had against Gam, believe it or not, where if they if they lost vision control, unlike a Korean <coughs> team, they looked a bit lost, actually. They looked like, what the fuck do we do now, you know? And they kind of just played in the dark. So here's the question, right? They've kept the same team, but they've now added in Peanut. So now, now potentially, we've got the same squad, but the one player everyone really criticized might now, assuming they play him, be upgraded with a player who... Absolutely, has a great ceiling, a very high ceiling, and actually, historically, though, doesn't necessarily want to play supportive style. So, what does a peanut-infused King's Own Dragon X, probably the worst fucking name I've ever heard of for anything outside of, like, an Atari game or something, what does the peanut-infused <laughs> Longju do? Does that upgrade them for you? Yes, significantly. Um, and it's not just because... So, uh, we've only seen this team together once uh, for, for a few series at the Kespa Cup. And um, again, that's not something where you want to necessarily take the results and say like this was a very serious tournament. Um, you saw both them and KT kind of playing very fast and loose in the finals. It's a really fun final, so I recommend if you just want to see two teams like go at each other and go ham and do some kind of random weird testing testing kind of draft picks out. Um, definitely watch that series. It's really fun. You get to see a lot of cool outplays, but um. Peanut on this team, um, it's weird to say, but it, because <clears throat> I don't necessarily think Peanut is, I don't think flexible is something I might ascribe to him because he did have a lot of struggles uh, fitting the role that SK Telecom wanted him to play. Um, but I do think that he, because he is a significant step up from Cuz in the jungle, I think he allows the rest of the team to do more um, because he himself can create a lot of pressure and that can be a problem for um, for King's Own's opponents. So they might not have to solely rely on splitting Khan off on a carry, which was something that they were able to do because their bot lane played so well and they, like, they had it all figured out where the bot lane would, would hold their own and do really well. 
um, BDD would continuously just keep mid pushed up, right? And then that meant that Cuz, even if he didn't take the most efficient jungle path, even if he might have been in a bad matchup and he's not taking advantage of a lot of opportunities either to counter jungle or to affect the side lanes, he is safe. He's not getting um, he's not getting blown out um, except for a few rare occasions. Like, again, if you look at, um, I believe it's game three from the finals, uh, the summer finals, you see where Blank really, really take it, takes advantage of Cuz's weaknesses in the jungle. Um, <clears throat> but then they can focus top, they can feed their top laner, and, and Khan can split off and carry and just be this monstrous presence on the map that you cannot ignore, right? Like, you ha someone has to go deal with him. And I think what Peanut does is he allows for the team to play a little differently. They have different ways that they can play because Peanut creates his own pressure, because he's probably not going to get exploited in the same way Cuz was. Um, I'm actually kind of hoping that they'll let BDD do his own thing a bit um, because I'd like to see him on maybe a few different style carry champions. Um, because I know he has it in him, but he was kind of on this massive wave clear duty where he would just sit in mid lane and no one could dislodge him because he was creating so much presence for Cuz to not not die, basically. Um, uh, so that's that's one thing that I'm looking out for is that Peanut might allow them to unlock BDD, and even if he even if that's not the route they decide to go with BDD being such a strong laning presence for this team, Pina is not the type of jungler like Cuz who's just going to sit back and farm on his side and then maybe go top. He will invade. Um, we, like, it's, again, it's not um, super reliable to base everything off of Kespa Cup results, but we already saw this, where he just, he went aggressive. He ganked his lanes. He invaded. Um, he was a lot like what people knew of him when he was on the Rocks Tigers. And with such a stable bottom lane and such a stable mid lane, that really, really unlocks Peanut as well, which is why I put this team slightly above KSV. And obviously that will change. They meet each other in the first week, but Khan is out because he made some remarks in solo queue, so he's suspended yes. for the first series. But um, after that, we'll we'll really see where these two teams stack up. But that's why I put King Zone slightly above, is because I do think Peanut will allow this team to be a bit more flexible. And BDD's presence in the mid lane is definitely not something to be underestimated either. Yes, I mean I can definitely see why you, you picked this team, uh, taking into account all factors as the as the number one team because. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Obviously, with we're, we're having to assume some of these players carry over ability level form from last year, but in a world in which they do, and then they do add Peanut, this seems like just what the doctor ordered. Because actually, the sad thing about Cars, in fact, there's actually a few teams who did this last year, where there was a few teams who had enough good players as their laners that they would have winning lanes, most lanes, and then the jungle actually, as you're saying, kind of just did nothing. He just literally farmed and was safe essentially. Now, in an ideal world, if you have three winning lanes. And then you have a player who's an aggressive jungler. That's where you just take over the game. Now you don't even have to yeah. worry about a late game. You can That guy can do whatever the fuck he wants because that's the dream for a jungler. And obviously we know Peanut loves carry junglers. So if, if any of those are available, I think this could be a very fun season. And, and elsewhere, they have so many carry threats, right? They're the opposite to, to Samsung in that sense. They've got every lane's got threats in it, right? <coughs> yeah, I mean, you have, like, Khan definitely has a... Uh... A carry, a carry mentality. Um, Prey and Gorilla, I think, because... So it's really interesting to see how this team matches up with KSV, right? Because KSV's adjustments at Worlds were what allowed them to overcome what is now the King's Own lineup. Um, and But I still think that Prey and Gorilla are the best bottom lane um, in Korea right now. So I think that, again, that Just also... Just anywhere, really. Yeah, it, it it like cannot be understated how good they are and just how used to each other they are as well, which is, again, I think another reason why 
uh, the Bang and Wolf thing was so weird is because they've played together for so long that that's another thing that kind of makes them stronger as a unit. Um, but Prey and Gorilla are the same way, where they just they know each other really well. You never have to worry about um, Gorilla leaving lane and then Prey dying. Like Prey can kind of take over a lane by himself. Both of them have incredible initiation sense uh, in lane in terms of taking advantages of trades and then also out of lane and team fights. Um, it's just insane. I love that bottom lane. I'm really happy that I get to see them play again for another split. Or another I also year, feel rather. Like, like actually Peanut <laughs> just makes Khan's life even easier here because the other thing about that bot lane is even though I, like, I think it's the best bot lane, they, they actually kind of used it as the insurance policy a lot in those games. You know, they wouldn't kind of be too risky with it. And obviously... Khan was amazing with Koz, so hopefully with Peanut, Peanut's someone who very, is very much adept to ganking for the top laner. Now you can actually be super aggressive like he wants to be, and in theory, you can lose some games because you've got winning lanes elsewhere, and if it goes well for you, you're just gonna, you're gonna snowball out of control, you'd hope. Yeah. Yeah, right. really, I just, uh, from what we saw already with this team, from talking to the team members themselves, it really seems like Peanut was just, like, automatically fit in immediately like there was no you know there's no transition period there was no awkwardness with him coming onto this team um it was just a perfect fit from the get-go so i'm really looking forward to see how they perform now the fourth team we will talk about was the fourth team last split which was kt rolster and the reason why <laughs> you need to talk about this team i mean fourth in terms of like world's qualification at least the reason why this team is so tough to talk about is because I still <coughs> look at their roster now on paper and think they should just win LCK automatically. Like the roster still looks amazing and they've made some changes because they brought in Rush as the sub jungler. Yes, the same Rush from Tip, from Cloud9. And they've also brought in a substitute mid laner in UCAL. Admittedly, Pawn is someone who's had health issues and has had reasons as to why maybe you might at least want to put kind of a fire under his ass that, like, you know, maybe we could sub you out of the game. What do you think about the sub additions first? What do you, what's your kind of speculation on what <coughs> the concept is here? So UCAL has been on, <coughs> has been on the team for a bit, actually. <laughs> it was just a matter of him turning of age. Um, so I am really glad that. <laughs> I'm really happy to see a substitute mid laner for Pawn um, because even though, so Pawn has done a couple of interviews going into the season, he's like, I'm super motivated, I'm ready, all this other stuff. Um, I do think it's good to have that kind of shadow behind him just in case because, again, he's had health issues. He also, um, if you watched him on EDG or even way back on, on Samsung, he kind of played this role where he would... Um, as soon as you unlock him from the lane, he draws a lot of pressure on the map. And towards the uh, towards the end of summer, the way people kind of decided to deal with KT Rolster is taking advantage of that because Pawn's map awareness with the rest of the team wasn't as good. Um, if that makes sense, like he would be kind of off doing his own thing, but instead of the team being able to leverage it, he would just die um, and kind of cost them advantages. So. I do really, <clears throat> I do really like UCAL. I know a ton of people are high on Rush um, because they remember him from from North America. I'm not really sure about the Rush pickup, although I will say that Score um, was not playing as well towards the end of uh, towards the end of last summer, um, despite the fact that I still think he's the best jungler. So I'm not really sure about the about the rush pickup. I'm curious to see how they use it uh, because right now in my head I can't see a world in which the team operates without score because he's so kind of integral to keeping the team together. Um, but we'll see. I mean, the the rush pickup is the only like question mark, and that's not me saying like, oh man, rush sucks and score is a god. Um, it's more that. I haven't seen a reason to substitute out score from watching their games. Yes. Well, one thing that I did find frustrating when I watched the actual games, not just look at the, the <coughs> line upon paper, which is still amazing, is when I watched the games themselves, it was quite clear even early on with this lineup that Katie was going to have problems because they, uh, while you would hope when you have an all-star roster 
that everyone just plays amazingly. You have the three winning lanes and then the jungler already who's an amazing jungler. And that's what you basically hope is there are no problems. It's just from day one's amazing. Well, from day one, this looked like a team that had two entirely functional halves of a proper team, but unfortunately just in one team and therefore like neutralized itself. Because if you'd have taken Score and Smeb and put them on another team with a weaker bot lane and played only through the top, I think that'd have been an amazing team. If you'd have taken Death to Matter and put them on a team that just had a tank player as the top laner, I think that's an amazing team and you'd have an amazing late game team. The problem was having these two teams together, first of all, you had the two carries that they seemingly couldn't decide between. Was it going to be smeb or was it going to be deft but then you had the two players who in theory you want to have have a lot of say over how the game's played you have score and you have matter and which one of those is going to win out and so it seems like the big vocal personality was matter they let him decide a lot of the team and therefore he decided to play through his lane and it looked like a lot of the resources did go through deft a lot of the time which to me is kind of like a waste of smeb if you know what i mean so what's it, what's your take on what they did last year and, and, and <coughs> presumably they can't just do that again this year right so communication was a huge problem for this team and it's something that um they came out and said several times like made even had this when they were struggling in spring, I believe, um, he had this interview where he was like, you know, I always thought my way, my way was the best. And, you know, we could just like have one strong voice on the team, but a more democratic approach is actually what's going to work. And he's not the only person to say that um, as League of Legends has become more of a team game, you see a lot of these old style shot callers uh, being like, okay, you know, it does have to be a more democratic approach. Everyone has to be talking. Um, I think the main problem with KT is that everyone was talking because if you remember, even Smeb was one of the louder voices on <clears throat> on the Tigers. Um, I do agree that they never really solidified how they wanted to distribute <clears throat> who was going to carry on the map and when. Um, and because they did... Uh, kind of put Smeb in a secondary role a lot of the time, it would come to the point where KT would just have this phenomenal early game, right? Like they pick yes. winning lanes. Um, I think they actually drafted uh, outside of a few like major hiccups that you can kind of go and see that very obviously you're like this draft might not have suited this team very well. I think they actually drafted to what they wanted to do. Um, in game and they would smash the early game and I'm not just talking about laning I'm talking about um, their early to mid rotations to take turrets um, their <coughs> their river control um, it was just all <coughs> they seemed to be completely on top of it <coughs> until the mid game and then <coughs> they would kind of fall apart in terms of <coughs> I don't know if it was a I mean I assume it was a communication breakdown of like someone saying let's do this someone else is saying let's do this and um, that's when they kind of would falter and then rely on Deft as like their late game insurance almost. So yes. like when basically it what it came to look like in the end of the season, and I'm not saying this is definitely what was going on in the sure. team, but what it looked like from their play is that really strong understanding of how the team worked early, middling to poor mid-game decisions, and then we'll rely on Deft to carry us late. And I think that's why Deft actually drew a lot of criticism um, towards the end of the season because they did put him in that in the singular carry role where he would be the only late game carry. Yes. And then if he mispositioned once, if he dies, if he dies once, then the rest of the team doesn't have enough damage to no. even win a fight at all. Um, and that became a huge problem for KT. So I actually don't mind that they kept this, kept this roster. Um, I am curious to see where um, they work in Rush. And I'm also curious to see if they do swap in UCAL if they feel like Pawn is still having those serious laning issues. Um, because it's not even like... So it's actually really funny. You know what I said about Crown? With his Talia, how he really yeah. knows how to affect side lanes, right? Even if he's doing really poorly in lane. Pawn's Talia is like the opposite. He was terrible on that champion. Um, and I don't know whether it's just communication breakdown between him and the side lanes, but he really didn't seem to know like when to wall or when to affect the side lanes if he could. Um, 
And this is a player that is known for kind of taking out the twisted fate and doing that, right? And kind of affecting the side lanes and, um, and distracting the team on the map so the rest of the team can do stuff. So it was really hilarious and kind of sad to see that he couldn't do that on champions like Talia, for example. Um, and which also kind of points to a communication breakdown between him and the rest of the team. So I don't know. I assume that UCAL has been scrimming with them for a bit because, like I said, he's been with the team for for uh, longer than than this season. Um, it's just that he's very young. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's actually the interesting part about this team is like, <coughs> first of all, <coughs> it's, it's not even like last year's play makes me think that you should throw away any of the players because as you said there were times when it was looking fucking great obviously in, in the summer split they actually looked like they got it together towards the end and they were going to make the run and then obviously they didn't because they played SK Telecom but with that said I actually do feel like the subs they've brought in are just to give them more options so that if the same thing happens again, now that we've got potential options here. So in terms of UCAL, well, if Pawn's going to be a liability, if UCAL can just play okay, maybe that's just the option. You just go in there, you just you just play to go even in mid. You don't do anything crazy. Everyone else on the map will do whatever needs to be done. That might be enough to actually, as in, like, here's the thing. In that scenario, you just want to plug the leak. That's it. You're not trying to fill the bathtub more than that. You've already got all the other faucets on. And then the rush one is the very interesting one because I feel like the only reason you would have rush in this team, right, he's clearly not a better jungler than score, but... The one thing you can say about Rush was he did just put the accelerator pedal to the floor whenever he played. He was like the pop-off jungler, you know. So to me, that's the player where if for some reason the, there's some sort of a communication disconnect between Matter and Score, maybe they just use him for specific compositions where they want, for example, to just gank the fuck out of Smeb all day long and just try and get him rolling. Or it's just not working with a certain team fight comp, you know, and they think, right, well, if it gets out of lane, we didn't have good comms between us, you know, because after... After seeing the teams that Mata played in after Samsung White, I feel like while I did always rate Dandy very highly, I think that I, I think maybe a lot of the decisions he were making might not have just been him. I think he just was someone who was on the same page with Mata. And I think that's actually a key element is that if your score and you yourself <coughs> used to be the guy who made all the decisions and did everything before, it's going to be hard to kind of let the other guy have all of his say and just do what he does. In fact, it's actually going to take away a strength of yours, bizarrely, you know? Yeah, I am curious to see where they fit Rush in. Um, Do you think they can win the league? I think they can. It's So it's like the opposite of SKT, right? Where like last year we were like, well, SKT always adjusts in time to win. With KT, it's like they always fall apart in, in time to lose. So um, they definitely have the ability to win. Um, they need to figure out <laughs> why they have such a... <laughs> hard time against SKT specifically. Um, I mean, that might not be much of an issue anymore though, right? It's a different SK Telecom. <clears throat> Hopefully. Uh, I don't know. I, Cause it's so, there's something going on that I cannot personally speak to um, on the team itself uh, that I cannot speak to as an outsider as to why they always seem to crumble against, against SKT. So um, hopefully this season, I mean, they, I put Kingzone and KSV, like I said, above this KT team, but it's always a matter of if KT figures yes. it out, then they will be the best team in Korea because that's the the sheer amount of talent on yes. this team. Yeah, and likewise, I actually <laughs> think that they've only added positives here. Like, first of all, as we've said, SK Telecom potentially got weaker. Then you've got, they've got subs that actually kind of make sense. You can see like what you could maybe do with these guys. And, and you know, your ideal scenario is maybe you don't have to play them at all. So cool. And then the final detail that we can't really comment on because again, it's coaching. So who the fuck knows? But remember they have changed the coaching staff. So like that, at least you would figure maybe that's a fresh look on things. Maybe there's someone else comes in with a new set of eyes to, because the key thing with this lineup is this is the dream lineup if you're a coach, because not only did they fuck it up before, but you've got so much talent all over the roster. So you know if you do it right, as you're saying, it's not even like they should just be better. They should be the best. So I think they're definitely an exciting team. Right. I'll give you your choice. Which team do we go to next out of the other teams? Which one really kind of catches your eye or has something interesting to talk about with them? Who do you go to now? Africa. The Africa. Africa. Free. Okay. So Definitely. obviously one of the key elements here is this is a team that has a sub player at every position. 
Then yep. you have to also add in, it's presumably going to be an entirely different Afrika Freaks because they don't have Marin. And they really did kind of let that guy play carry top style any day he wanted in that team. And obviously, yes, he was hit and miss, but when he carried, it looked fucking amazing. So what is an Afrika Freaks team without Marin and with subs at every position? What's, what's exciting about this team for you? So what I think, uh, and again, I can't presume to speak to the team, but the lineup I'm looking at to come out of this team is Keen, Spirit, Kuro, Kramer, Tucson. Um, and obviously they do have a sub for every single position. They picked up basically an entire line of, of rookie talent that are all high solo queue players uh, in Ruby, Aiming, and Jelly. And then they also picked up Summit for top, uh, who had a very unimpressive... <clears throat> one series in the um, in the Kespa Cup, and then they picked up Keen, who is the re- he's kind of the reason why I'm looking at this team, and I'm like, oh, this team is suddenly interesting to me again because I think he was an underrated player when he was on Ever Eight Winners, um, which was not a good team, but they had Marong, Septed, and then Keen as these kind of very strong individual players. Um, and I wasn't sold, I wasn't super sold on Keen until I watched him more recently on champions like <laughs> Shen. Um, and that it sounds really weird because you're like, oh, okay, you're saying this person is can carry and be good, but then you're watching him on things like Shen or Maokai or something. But what happens when you watch top laners <coughs> on those specific champions is you get to see a lot more about how they see the map, um, when they're teleporting in, how they're setting up either zone control on Maokai or how they're targeting uh, people in team fights with Shen. Um, and I was actually really impressed with uh, Keen's team fight targeting. <clears throat> and that's when I kind of be- began looking at him differently and, and being like, oh, this, this guy is actually a pretty smart player um, on his own on kind of a rough team. So now that he joins Afrika, I am really curious to see him with the lineup of Spirit, Kuro, Kramer, and Tucson. Um, because I think Kramer <clears throat> improved last year. He kind of went from an 80 carry where they were giving him resources <laughs> because otherwise he would <clears throat> play really I mean, poorly. It was 100 or 0, right? Yeah. yeah. had to be a guy player or <laughs> yeah. did fuck all. Yeah. yeah, like if you didn't if you didn't feed him be, uh, basically your farm, he would be really bad. Um, but he he proved that he was, you know, something more than that to the point where he justifies uh, those kind of resources. You have Kuro, who is weirdly the pivot point (coughs) around which this team operates because Kuro is the opposite. He takes no resources and they don't focus on him whatsoever. He's kind of just relied to hold mid lane. Which is his career, right? But he's good at it. Yeah. He he knows Um, what he's doing. And then you have Spirit, who is, I mean, he has had such a weird career when people try to, I try to look at him. I'm not as high on him as other people, but I'm also not as low on him as some people might be. Um, it's clearly someone who's got some something left in the tank, right? Yeah, no, he and he can also play like you saw. I mean, I know a lot of people will point out you saw the jungle Lulu weird compositions where they were doing like a double ardent rush. They were the team that developed the uh, the Targon's uh, AD carry, the, the Relic Shield AD carry to rush ardent in the bot lane. The freaks were actually the first team to do that where you basically sacrifice laning to rush Ardent Sensor more quickly. And the reason I'm pointing that out is just because this team can be really creative uh, and smart. And their MO last year in summer was kind of, they'd win the first game with this like incredible preparation and these really cool strategies. And they would just absolutely mop the floor with their opponents, right? And then they come back and they'd like lose game two really badly Um, so for this split, I'm curious to see how they use Keen because again, I do think he's a smart player and I want to see them develop from that kind of, we have a really creative side to us, but we can only show it for one game. Um, cause I think there's something there. There's something really interesting to watch about this team, even with the loss of Marin and 
obviously, um, I'm not trying to downplay that because it's huge. Like Marin yeah. <laughs> just draws so much pressure as a top laner. You can't, again, you just can't ignore him on the map. And I don't think Keen can be that for this team right away. But I definitely do think he's someone that you should, uh, people shouldn't underestimate, and he's a player that people should be looking out for. I mean, like you say, logically, <laughs> a lot of this is going to rely on whichever the top laner they end up using most of the time, how that guy does. Because Kuro's specialty, yes, he is a low econ mid, but who's quite cerebral, you know. He, does, he doesn't get his ship pushed in, even though people know he's not ever going to get all the resources. And then the bot lane, as you kind of mentioned, especially that particular bot lane you want to see, the Kramer Tussin one, those are both two ham players. Like Tussin, even when he was on the bad Incredible Miracle teams, he at least tried to go for plays, you know. He tries to be a playmaker, so... I feel like the top lane has to surely be the element that makes this either a good team or an average team. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. what that's what I'm looking at in terms of where this team falls. And that's why the reason why I rated them more highly than kind of the middle of the pack, which I think is um, are your like barbecue Olivers, your Jin Air, your uh, your Rocks Tigers is kind of like the next, I guess, yes. tier of teams. Um, but that's why I rate Afrika more highly than that, especially if they're playing uh, the lineup that I said, just because I think that that lineup can be really creative and really flexible, and you'll see them pull out maybe some really cool compositions. So the Barbecue Oliver's team is a team that actually got some very interesting pickups because their two additions were Trick, who obviously has won four EU LCS splits, was even an MVP <laughs> of those splits. In fact, he might even have been the MVP of both. I forget if it was the second one. And then obviously they got Ignar, who at the moment, his stock is very high thanks to the Worlds and Misfits and this bizarre scenario where somehow not being able to play the meta made him actually look better, which is like... I mean, listen, I think Wolf gets part of the MVP award for that. You know, like, he kind of set him up there. It's like he threw the alley up to his own, to, to the opponent team who then slammed it in the back. So what do you think about these two additions? Like, the, uh, the problem here is obviously these are players who've made their name outside of Korea. So we're now seeing them return to Korea. What do you expect? Um, I'm also curious about this team too. Um, I think the main thing with Trick is that I want to see uh, how he plays in the jungle upon returning to Korea um, because a lot of times when you see Korean junglers go elsewhere um, even if they and I'm not talking about trick because we didn't really see him yes. outside of what, like, I think Korea. one game or two yeah. games on CJ um, so I don't even include those to be quite honest but um, a lot of times when you see or initially when you saw that mass <laughs> exodus to China right you'd see a lot of junglers kind of play really safely um, and just farm up, like basically just power farm, um, even if they were previously aggressive in uh, in Korea. I think Kakao is probably the most <coughs> uh, yes. glaring example of this. But um, a lot of times it's because you have a Korean player, they might not speak the language <laughs> when they are um, put on a, another team. And so they know the best way that they can help their team is by just farming up and being really useful in the late game. Now, Trick is someone who doesn't seem to be that for me. Like, he seems to be a jungler who is honestly and legitimately comfortable with farming to late. And that seems to be just his style. So that's the thing that I'm looking for at this team specifically right off the bat. I'm wondering if Trick changes his style at all or if he's going to continue to be this kind of power farming force of a jungler. Now, either way, it's an upgrade from Bless. So, like, regardless of whether we suddenly see a brand new trick where he's, you know, affecting lanes really early and doing some super aggressive counter jungling, or whether he just continues this very slow, steady, uh, kind of crushing jungle presence where he has a lot of jungle control in general, Either way, it's an upgrade from Bless. So that that is a plus. Um, that's another reason why this team is looking really interesting. The side lanes <coughs> are also very interesting because Crazy sometimes lives up to his name, uh, where he can either be 
very aggressive or a liability. It seems like they have actually within the team identified that they're going to let him play more of a starring role, right? He used to be someone who was stuck on the tanks and now he gets some of the carries, some of the bruises and, and presumably if you have Trick, if, they, if they're if they buying into that, it's going to be going through him a lot, right? Yeah, him and then the bot lane is actually the other, so the other point of pressure because Tempt is, again, strong wave clear mid. I'm not really looking at him to do much more than that. Um, that's all he has to do on this team, though, right? Especially if you have Trick controlling the jungle, you have Tempt on wave clear duty mid. You're looking at the side lanes as your two points of pressure. There's Crazy who can draw pressure, but can also be a bit of an idiot sometimes. And then you have Ignar and Ghost. And Ghost was this super hyped rookie uh, when he was on CJ. And then it obviously it hasn't panned out quite yet. <laughs> but I still think he's very good. And so I'm curious to see how he partners up with a support like Ignar, who is obviously loves to just take control of the lane itself yes. from the get go and provide this really strong laning presence. <coughs> um, he also likes to be unlocked from lane as well. Like once he establishes dominance in the bot lane, he'll go roam to other lanes to affect those lanes. And that could actually work really well with trick if Trick isn't ganking, it takes pressure off of him so he can farm as well. So if all the pieces come together on this team, it can actually be a surprisingly strong team. Um, the reason why I put them a little bit lower is because we just don't know how it's going to work. Uh, like, like any roster that changes big pieces like this, this team is completely different than last year's BBQ Olivers, even though they only have two new players coming in. Okay. I wanted to get your take on the Jin Air team because this is a team that has seen a number of changes. They brought in Justice as their mid laner. Uh, interestingly, for anyone who used to see the old Samsung team, they've gotten Wraith. They've gotten the support player that you might have remembered they sometimes used to use. It was like half and half. You know, they'd sometimes use him, they'd sometimes use Core JJ. Obviously, with Worlds 2016, Core JJ, especially with the whole MF pick, etc. Like a couple of these teams were, a, he was he was able to kind of overshadow Wraith there, right? Wraith's a pretty exciting player, I think personally. I, I, I liked him as a player. I wanted to see more of him. So now we get to see him on a different team. What do you think he's going to do on Jinnah? Wraith makes this lineup for me, actually, because I would have been super down on this team. <laughs> super down on this team otherwise. Um, there are huge question marks in the mid lane with Grace and Justice. Grace is also Yaharong. He played for them in the Caspa Cup. Um, oh, he's okay. their most recent pickup. He's like a very high solo queue player. And then Justice, who has been... People have spoken very highly of him, but obviously he hasn't uh, started. He's been on the bench um, behind... The likes of BDD and Fly. Um, you have Omti, who is uh, not the brightest sometimes, but he does some like very exciting plays. So that's actually where I'm looking at Wraith, because I give Wraith an enormous amount of credit for helping Ambition um, back when they were both initially on the team and Ambition was just coming off of CJ, because I actually don't think that Ambition really knew a lot about the jungle position itself. He knew how to farm, and he did really well as just a general player, but he didn't necessarily know how to communicate with his lanes or affect his lanes as much. And I think Wraith really, really helped him um, on that team. He kind of roamed with him. He set up a lot of vision, and it was night and day when they first started substituting Core JJ in on that team because Ambition would suddenly look lost. Like he would look like he didn't know what to do, or he would look like he was expecting um, a certain ward to be somewhere, and then he would aggressively invade, and then obviously the ward wasn't there. He would get caught out and die. Um, and so I give Wraith a tremendous amount of credit for that, and I think one thing that's really been overshadowed in Ambition's journey to becoming a very good jungler, in my opinion, is how much Wraith helped him and how much the eradication of lane swaps also helped. Because once that happened, Samsung didn't need to use Wraith anymore. Um, because Ambition A had learned enough about the position that yeah, he... Yeah, which by the way, just for context, for anyone who doesn't remember or wasn't around at that time, they actually made this hard uh, limitation to doing lane swaps for just before the playoffs in LCS of summer split. So it was very, very late in the season that suddenly you couldn't be the team that just lane swapped and therefore either had a top lane or a bot lane that you could get out of trouble. 
Yeah. And this is all the way back in 2016. Um, <laughs> And that's when you saw Core JJ coming in, and because he's such a strong leaning support, um, him and Ruler suddenly looked like this very kind of terrifying lane to go up against because they were very strong in lane. Core JJ had a really good understanding of how to be a good presence in lane and how to continuously poke his opponent. Um, and Ambition was at the point where, because they weren't doing lane swaps, he didn't need someone like Wraith kind of helping him on routine vision rotations. Um, he still got caught out <laughs> on a few, on a few invades, most famously the one against TSM in the, in the groups at yeah, 2016 worlds. Yeah. But um, I think that uh, Wraith as a player is a very smart player and he kind of makes this team for me because a, hopefully he'll be able to pass on some of that wisdom to Umti, who is a player with an immense amount of talent, but doesn't necessarily always make the best decisions in the jungle. Um, and sometimes would get exploited and die a lot because of it. Teddy is also a player that I feel like anyone who watched last year uh, probably knows of because he came out and was this really dominant uh, AD carry that uh, a lot of people weren't expecting, but he is definitely a name that you want to watch out for on this team as well. And I'm very curious to see him partnered with Wraith because Teddy is also not the type of AD carry that necessarily needs Wraith to be in lane with him. Um, this will allow Jenner to unlock Wraith if they need to, uh, to help Umti. So that's really what I'm looking for from this team is how, because Wraith is such a like jungler support almost, that I'm curious to see what he does for the overall vision of this team. Now, obviously, this is also going to depend on how well their mid laners do, which I honest, yes. I, I don't know how. Um, that's a big question mark for this team. Okay. See, the interesting <laughs> thing there is that's a, that's a quite a good storyline for people to keep out as like a, like a kind of a slow burner, is if Wraith can somehow help the jungler, because the jungler has his work cut out for him, because if so on isn't the best player on this team, then no one informed him. Like, he actually thinks that this is like, like he's the fucking carry top lane king and everything should go through him, you know? So in the bot lane, as you mentioned, I actually think, yeah, Teddy was pretty good last year. I thought legitimately he was one of those names that an SK Telecom might consider trying to steal, you know, and maybe get another AD carry or go a different route than Bang. So surprised he just remained at this team. So the real question mark here is what are their mid laners going to look like? And, and do they have a notion of how they're going to play? Because it, that can be the thing that could kill or enable the rest of what the good parts of the team to function. Yeah, it'd be a lot easier to evaluate this team if they'd hold, held on to Kuzan because Kuzan was very good in lane and he was able to, again, like I know I keep returning to this, but that when I'm looking at rookie junglers who are really struggling to figure out the map, I look at their mid laners and... Um, I know I keep returning to the mid jungle thing, but one thing Kuzan did for Umti again is he <clears throat> created enough pressure or he kept pushing up mid enough that Umti, yes, he got punished for some of his more erroneous uh, or overly aggressive <clears throat> invades or decisions, but he was helped out by that a lot. Um, so I'm hoping that Justice or Grace will be able to step into that role. But that's the huge question mark about Jinner. Okay, so <coughs> the reason Kuzon is not there is he went over and joined the Rocks Tigers. Now, the Rocks Tigers is, like, you can obviously tell that this team, I mean, aside from the fact they lost, like, what could have been a world champion, you can tell this team is not good at getting sponsors because they've just never had any star player signings ever since all those big names left, you know. If you might remember, they even lost some of their other players over to, I think it was Africa <coughs> Freaks or something Mickey. like that. So, yeah, so they, they ended up in a scenario where they haven't main, re retained any of their talent. But this lineup is full of players who either are becoming veterans, you know, we've seen them in LCK quite a long time, or they have a couple of names who at times at least have shown some flashes, you know, Sang Yoon's one I'm thinking of, like obviously Kuzon had times he was pretty decent over the last few years. What do you actually make of this whole mix? Because they're another team that have got a few different subs in there, but probably don't come in with high expectations. Yeah, um, <clears throat> the Tigers kind of were able to take games off of people, but then they would also just have really bad coordination. And while Mickey was still on the team, so if you remember TL signed Mickey late 
um, last year. <coughs> but previously, they had both Mickey and Song Yoon. And even though they didn't give all of their resources and attention to Mickey, Mickey is a player that will kind of make or break a game. Um, <coughs> and so... I feel like they struggled with that. They struggled with where to uh, give resources and attention between Song Yoon and Mickey. And then once Mickey left, they had a lot of struggles in the mid lane with Lava just not being able to create any sort of pressure. Um, and they also kept swapping between Shy, who retired, <laughs> and Linderong in the top lane. Um, I think Song Yoon is actually quite good. Uh, He's someone who I thought had a career split last year and really stepped up, even though his team wasn't that good or coordinated. Um, so with him and Kuzan on the same team, this it, Rocks Tigers become a lot more interesting to me. The problem or the concern is definitely the top side of the map. Um, Kuzan, again, he's a strong control mid. He'll be able to hold mid completely fine. Um, so now you're looking at Song Union Key in the bottom lane should be fine, but <coughs> I'm still not sold on the top side of this. Uh, they have Mighty Bear and Xiang Huan. Um, I'm definitely not sold on, on Xiang Huan, so maybe he steps up with more mid lane control because even though Mickey was a force to be dealt with in mid lane, I wouldn't say he was a control mid. He, uh, he definitely was either way up or way down. So with Kuzan providing stability, you then have to look at whether the top side of the map is going to perform well. Um, because otherwise, it'll be up to Song Yin to carry games completely. Okay. Right. There are two teams <laughs> left, Emily. And these two teams uh... are underwhelming as fuck. <laughs> because first of all, they just kept pretty much the same players. So it's not like he can even be like, oh, maybe this, that, the other could change. And then secondly, it's not like they're all bad players. Like, actually, it shows how LCK improved year on year on year. That if these are the bottom teams, there's still some decent players in here. Like, beyond Ian, they're decent enough players. You've got the odd player on Kongdu isn't terrible. Is there any reason to hope for either of these two to do something? Uh, it's going to be tough, um, <clears throat> mainly because they... So let's start with MVP first, because I think they're a little bit easier to talk about, because we've seen a lot of them. Um, at best, they were just barely a playoff team, right? Uh, yes. They were kind of this upset playoff team with some really unique picks uh, in the top lane and also uh, for Max in the bottom lane as a support. Now... <clears throat> their glaring weakness was in AD carry with Maha, who um, would just misposition <laughs> and die a lot of the times. Um, he didn't really seem to know how to trade in lane very well, even with Max kind of helping to prop him up, because Max is a very good support. Um, and so <clears throat> they decided <laughs> their one roster move was picking up Pilot, and now, way back when Pilot first started, veteran he, AD carry, yes, <laughs> he was he was uh, known as actually being like quite prodigious. He was kind of seen as this very strong. He was able team to fighter. displace the legacy player Captain Jack, if you remember, and they, they went with <laughs> I, Pilot I was, as the main I'm AD carry. Still, so you're really bitter about Easy Hoon. I'm bitter about that because I thought I loved Captain Jack on that team. But anyway, um, I think Pilot is the thing that really frustrates me with uh, Pilot is that he he's the opposite of Maha, right? So where I was talking to Papa Smithy on Twitter about this, where Papa Smithy said that both of them have trouble doing damage in team fights, which is obviously a huge issue if you are an AD carry. Mm -hmm. And now with Maha, it's because he mispositions and dies. With Pilot, it's because he plays too safely. Um, and so he'll, he won't position himself well enough to do damage um and so it's kind of the same result even with different players who have uh different play styles because they have similar issues so if pilot can be better in lane than maha that is something <laughs> to look out for for this team but <clears throat> i'm <clears throat> i'm just really 
not sold on MVP being able to do much, given the fact that the one change they did, again, in my opinion, maybe I'll be proven wrong. Maybe Pilot will just be this absolute beast. But um, <clears throat> in my opinion, is kind of a lateral adjustment. I don't see them performing very well, given the strength of the other talent in this league. Okay. What and then Kongdu is just, again, uh, they've kind of always, for the past, what, almost two years now, they've kind of just flirted with the border of being yeah. top tier challenger team, bottom tier LCK team. Um, they have a few strong points in like Edge, <coughs> who used to be a KT sub, Soul, yes. I still think, has a lot of talent. Um, and you always kind of see him again, like Korean solo queue isn't necessarily a great point of reference in terms of how well a player will play professionally, but he does perform very well in, in solo queue. He has a lot of talent and he's definitely someone that when people look at this Kongu lineup, they're like, Oh, you know, soul, he's, he's pretty good. Right. Uh, <coughs> but they've always had jungle problems. Um, they've had some problems with the top side of the map with, I mean, he's gone now, but Hippo, who was really bad, and Roach, who was <coughs> sometimes kind of shaky. Um, they picked up Raze and Yujun as their two junglers. Um, previously, they had Punch. I'm not sure how either of them, <coughs> either of them will do on this team. Um, it's, again, like this... Part of it is just that this season is so stocked with... Uh, with really good talented lineups that I don't see Kongdu being able to move up much. Um, they were my last place ranked team when I went through all 10 teams. Okay. So who would you put forward as the MVP? Who do you think is going to end up as the MVP? See, see if you can figure out what, what right reasoning you would do to get there and then who's going to be your pick? Mm. <clears throat> so if I'm going off of what I said in terms of ranking, I'll I'll say that if my if my ranking turns out exactly correct, right, and King Zone end up as the top team, I'll pick someone from that team. Um, who is the MVP on that team? Because obviously last season they had your old boy BDD, right? So yeah, <laughs> I would actually say that. It's hard not to say that it would be Prey. I think of Prey very highly um, because I think he does so much for that team that's not just being a reliable presence in the bottom lane. Um, but BDD is another one that I'm looking out for because, again, Peanut allows for them to maybe take some more risks with BDD. Like, say they pop in tonight and BDD gets Zoe and he just goes off. Like that would be super fun to see since he's certainly talented enough to do something like that. So. Okay. Right. Here's I would the say it would be, it would be between those two for me. So it's between BDD and prey for you. Okay. So here's the thing, right? There's, unfortunately, especially for the LCK MVP, because it works on this very bizarre MVP format, and so it actually depends how far the team goes as to whether you can <laughs> be the fucking MVP, which definitely don't like that. Much prefer the, <laughs> u the universe in which uh, people may remember Duke won the MVP and then his team did absolutely nothing. So I will say this, okay, right? If SK Telecom somehow wins, it will definitely be Faker who is the MVP because how the fuck else is SK Telecom going to win the LCK? I actually also think in a world where I'm not thinking of the criteria they use for this one, Faker already might be the MVP this season because I think he, it's just going to demand so much of him in this squad that I think even if the team doesn't go far, by the Duke logic I gave before, he could be the best player <laughs> in the league. But... Odds are, I don't think SK Telecom's going far, and, I, and as a result, I don't think he can be the MVP. So instead, I think it has to be, bearing in mind, in line with what I said about Samsung, I think they tend to more win as a team, so I don't really see them having an MVP. It probably has to be someone from King's own Dragon X. So the funny thing with this one is, 
I agree with you. I think I, you could make a very strong case that Prey could be the MVP, <coughs> maybe was even the MVP last year, personally, I thought. But unfortunately, again, knowing the bias of how people vote, I don't think he'll win because actually his style, it's not as sexy, you know, so I don't think you win if you're in it. Like if you're an AD carry, you kind of have to just straight hard carry the game before people give you the MVP. So sadly, I think it's between the solo laners. So I'm going to go ahead and say that it will be Khan because I think if King's own oh. wins and Peanut does really well, he's going to make <laughs> Khan look really really good and Khan will definitely just pick those carries because now he doesn't even have to in theory go to tanks very often so I actually think that all the sacrifices all the th factors will just mean that as usual the filthy laner gets all the credit for the ganks of the jungler and gets to win and that's just how I rational it out when I try to figure out, you know, like a real world scenario of who would end up in the final and then what factors would make people vote for someone. So I think this might be the time where Khan rides the hype. Okay, <laughs> at the end of this episode, do you have any final words for us, Emily, as we close the show? Um, I mean, people might not know, but I'm actually a huge KT fan, which is probably why I rag on them okay, so much. Right. Yeah. Um, so I this hope could be they the do season. well. Yeah, yes. I hope they do well. I hope this is their year. And I, I don't have to, you know, be sad. <laughs> I'm Kelsey Moser, and you're watching Thorne's YouTube channel, where no sandbagging goes unscrutinized.